The following is a hoop ball presentation. I'm doing well. Can't complain. Happy to be back on another podcast. Oh yeah, this, is a, this, is a, this could be called a series. You never know with me, so we're just gonna kind of play by ear and keep it going. But um, for those who heard the last podcast, we we're gonna go and start some deep dives into teams. We start we start with teams outside the bubble um, that will not be going to Orlando, that whose season is relatively, for all intents and purposes, over. Um, and just give a look into the off season. So we are gonna start with the Minnesota Timberwolves. Reach out to Eric. We're excited to get down to them. We had a bunch of great questions um, from the community on Twitter. In the um, uh, group chat, I mean, I appreciate all of y'all. I'm going to shout y'all out as we get to them. So thank you for that. And we'll kind of let that uh, evolve as we go into the conversation here. But we're going to start with the Timberwolves. Um, last season, they were 36 and 46, um, uh, 11th in Western Conference, 5th in the Northwest Division. They drafted Jared Culver, 6th overall out of Texas Tech. And then uh, Jalen Noel um, in the second round, 43rd overall. Um, lost Jeff Teague. Or they got Jeff Teague. We'll talk about him later. Um, he picked up his uh, player option. They lost uh, Tyus Jones, who went to Memphis. Taj Gibson, Derrick Rose, uh, Tal- Anthony Tolliver, Jared Bayless. Got all- a bunch of guys. Uh, Luol Deng retired. They were gone. In came um, Jake Lehman, who was in a sign-in trade for three years, um, $11.28 million. Um, Noah Vonley uh, for one year. Jordan Bell. Uh, Nas Reed, undrafted rookie signing for four years, $6 million. Um, and then Jordan McLaughlin, who was on a two-way contract um, previously with the Long Island Nets. Um, and uh, now, other than that, I mean, oh, the Jared Culver uh, signing, I mean, they drafted him. He was also acquired um, in a trade with Phoenix for Dario Sarge and the draft rights to Cam Johnson. Got to point that out. Uh, went through the season. Oh, you know, injuries were riddled. It was clear that they needed a separate direction. Andrew Wiggins started out on fire. Um, in fact, I was watching a game just a little bit ago um, where – uh, it, they were just raving over how he's been scoring in double figures for ten straight games. It was it was clearly was sign it was uh, time for change. So um, <laughs> for the the move the big move that um, Minnesota did was moving on from Andrew Wiggins, um, setting Wiggins uh, first round pick twenty twenty one top three protected and uh, twenty twenty one um, second round pick unprotected to Golden State in exchange for D'Angelo Russell. Um, Amari Spellman and Jacob Evans. They also made another minor move, moving Jeff Teague and Travion Graham to Atlanta for Allen Crabb. But um, you know, rest of the season played out. They, you had a oh, one more big trade that I completely almost forgot that kind of figures in heavily here. Um, was one concerning the the um, Timberwolves and the Denver Nuggets. Oh my goodness, my link just froze here. I'm telling you, man, the technical issues on my side jaw are amazing. Give me a sec. I'll pull that up. Um, <laughs> but basically, they acquired Juancho Hernan Gomez and Malik Beasley um, in, a, in a pretty big trade involving the Timberwolves, the Nuggets, and I'm sure it was one other team. It was a four. It was a four. The Rockets and the um, Hawks. Thank you. Okay, appreciate that. A big four team deal. Wow. <laughs> All these pieces. Um, yeah, and. They acquired those two. Those two are the big ones um, that are going to factor into the team we're talking about now and the future direction they're going in. But I've been stuttering through and freezing up here. I'm going to throw it over to Eric. Eric, what do you think so far about the moves that the Timberwolves made heading into the season, your initial thoughts, and how it kind of evolved up to the trade deadline? Um, I thought their offseason last summer, 2019, it's crazy because we're already in June of 2020. So it, right? it feels like we should be basically in the offseason now, but obviously they were, we're not. But um, their offseason last year I thought was, you know, pretty pedestrian. Uh, I wasn't a huge fan of the Colbert, uh pick. Um, they traded up for it. Remember, they traded Saric and pick 11 to move up to pick six. And I think a lot of people at the time wanted them to draft Kobe White, who was on the board, who eventually, you know, went to pick – uh, the next pick to the Bulls because there was a, a hole at point guard. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, the big thing last offseason was their chase of, of D'Angelo Russell, which the, it, obviously they didn't get him then. Um, but like you said, they obviously ended up did they obviously did trade for him during the season um, in an interesting trade. Obviously, I think everyone probably could agree that it was time to move on from Wiggins. Um, you know, now when we'll probably talk about this uh, is you know was it 
was the trade worth it given the draft capital that they gave up? And, and obviously we'll have to see what that 2021 pick becomes. But, yeah. um, you know, I thought that the signing or the signing trade of, of Jake Lehman was good. I thought that was a really good value contract there for, for a wing slash, you know, four. Um, but for the most part, you know, when talking about the Timberwolves, you talk about what happened in the span of like a couple of days in February. And that was trading for Russell and then, well, actually, I think it was trading for Beasley and Hernan Gomez first and then trading for Russell um, because that has like overhauled. Um, their current team, that given the draft capital they gave up for Russell, it impacts their future. Given the salaries that are going to have to happen now with Russell being on a contract and, and Beasley and Hernan Gamos being restricted free agents, that's going to impact their future salary cap situation. So I thought I liked their move to trade for Beasley and Hernan Gomez. Um, you know, they, they had to, they rerouted a lot of stuff in that four team deal and they gave up Covington, um, but they did end up getting another first from that deal as well from the Nets through the Hawks. I know it's complicated as hell, but, um, <laughs> but I like that side. I, I, I'm not sold yet on the D'Angelo Russell trade slash more of like, if he's really worth it to be your number two on this current team, but obviously we can dive into that, but you know, it's mm-hmm. interesting. It is. It really is. I was actually being the Denver Nuggets um, expert in the field that you are. I wanted to get your take on, the departure of Malik Beasley and Watcher Herman Gomez. We've talked about, we've danced around your thoughts on losing Malik Beasley um, to the Wolves. And I'll talk about his impact. Obviously, we're going to dive into that because um, his future in Minnesota is, is a, it's, it's not really even a big question mark, but, but determining how much he'll make um, and, and how small the sample size that he was, uh, that he had here in Minnesota. But just in general, I'm just going to run through it. He had 41 games um, this season with the Nuggets. Um, didn't start in any of them, um, 18 minutes a night, seven points, just under two rebounds, uh, just over an assist a game, 38% from the field, 36% from three, 86% from the line in 14 games, 14 big games mm-hmm. with the Timberwolves, all starts that those minutes went up from 18 a night to 33 points went up from seven to 20 points per game, five rebounds per game. The assists were just about the same, a little more or a little closer to two assists a night. But these are the shooting splits that were just crazy. 47% from the field, 42% from three, and a little bit of a drop-off from the free throw line, um, 75%, but that's still very good. He was just electric. Um, He had a a crazy – I mean, he was introduced February 7th, um, literally the very next night, 23 points, 10 rebounds, four assists, and one steal um, in a big win over the Clippers. Um, And then going 7 for 13 from the night from three – um, averaging 20 points per game in his first 14, um, a team high 8.2 three pointers attempted. I mean, this is it's a crazy, crazy uh, stretch, just a torn stretch for Beasley. And I mean, again, I want to know from the Nuggets' perspective. Obviously, you know, you already, with him and Hernan Gomez becoming restricted free agents, you already have um, Jokic on. You already have a massive extension from Murray. I'm sure the cap was something that was in mind for the Nuggets by getting rid of those guys, also a crowded backcourt. But can you give us some more perspective on why the Nuggets made that move? And then we can kind of delve into um, the new players' impact in Toronto, in uh, Minnesota. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's basically, uh, you know, what you just said is, is the two circumstances were the salary situations and the unknown with the restricted free agency for both of those players. Um, at, at that time, we didn't know that a pandemic was going to, you know, completely change what the salary cap might be or, or things like that. Or maybe, yeah. you know, potentially and very likely lower the salaries that Beasley and Hernan Gomez will get in October now. Um, but that's obviously too unknown to talk about now. But the other thing in the probably the bigger one, uh, you know, when you couple it with the unknown of the salaries is just the, like you said, the crowded, not even the backcourt, just the crowded depth chart that Denver had. Um, Gary Harris has become a really good defender. Uh, the three point shooting has kind of fallen off as has his offensive game. Um, and we talked about this on our young cores podcast, but he's still 25 and I think has two more years left on his deal. And you, you probably didn't see Beasley, you, uh, you know, passing him at the starting two guard position. Uh, Beasley is a little bit too small, I think, to be the three. Um, and then you go to the, the front court where Wancho was playing mostly at the four. And you've got Millsap, who's still their best power forward, who still probably wants to stick around for another year or two. But then they also traded for Jeremy Grant last summer and project to want to give him a, a long term deal you know, in a couple of months. And also they had to fit in Michael Porter at both the three and the four spots. 
and you know Porter has become um, kind of the center of of the future. Um, you know, it used to be talked about when you talk about the Nuggets core. It used to be Murray, Jokic, and Harris, but now it's almost Murray, Jokic, and Porter. Um, so obviously, finding time for him to develop and you know projecting that he will be a an even better contributor next season made it hard to see a consistent role for Hernan Gomez. And quite frankly, the Nuggets probably wanted to do right by those two players and send them to a team that, hey, this team is perfect system-wise. They want to bomb a lot of threes. That's great for Beasley and Hernan Gomez uh, in Minnesota. Um, but also that a team that's going to give them playing time for, for the rest of this season and, and probably the foreseeable future, especially given how they played. So I think it was just the crowded depth chart from basically one through five positions and then the salary cap uncertainty kind of made it, you know, the perfect circumstances to have that trade, you know, done in February. Well, I appreciate that. Definitely. I mean, and it does make sense um, getting rid of those guys. I myself did not expect to see um, the production that I guess not many people expected to see the production that we saw from Beasley specifically. Wancho had some good games as well. I think his fit is to be determined. He, again, Brought the same energy. Um, I think he was in double figures for, what, 9 of 11 of his first games at one stretch for um, the Timberwolves. Um, kind of being the same guy, he, you know, the same one I remember him being from Denver, which admittedly, I hadn't watched a whole lot of um, of Hernan Gomez, specifically or the Nuggets, um, outside of, you know, a marquee game, so I'm not the Nuggets expert. But <laughs> I will say, like, he had one, um, I think it was um, a game against the Magic where he had... Um, 18 points, 13 rebounds, five assists, two steals, and a block. And you think, I mean, the perspective here, or the, the thinking in my end is that you have Carl Anthony Towns next season. Between him and, and Hernan Gomez, who can kind of space the floor, you have those two. That gives him more of a space that floor, especially when you have two sharpshooters in, well, two relatively sharpshooters, and D'Angelo Russell and Beasley on the floor as well. You can kind of get, um, I, I guess, the small forward position kind of hammered out. But between those guys, you have a wide open floor that offensively is is really good, at least on paper, um, if not on the defensive end. Yeah, I mean, you know, the interesting thing, uh, and I actually looked it up about Wancho um, while you were talking about it. So I looked up his numbers. He also played 14 games like Beasley. Um, definitely, he saw his minutes increase a lot, but his averages were, you know, pretty good. I mean, 13 points per game, 7.3 rebounds per game. Uh, Wancho's an underrated rebounder um, at the four position. And he shot 42% from three uh, on almost five attempts per game. So, And the thing with Wancho in Denver is that he had like a very up and down, I think it was like three and a half seasons or four seasons, is that, you know, he had a lot of injuries. Um, I think he had mono one year. He which did. That can derail your season there. He had a core injury last year that he wow. played through and then had surgery on the, in the off season. So there were stretches where he looked like a guy who could average 13 and seven and shoot 40% from three. He'd do that for a month or two, but then there'd be months, you know, due to injury or maybe inconsistency or sometimes, you know, this year related to just the role, because like I said, the, the, the front court was very, very crowded for Denver. So some nights he would not play at all. Um, and that kind of inconsistency, you know, obviously as we would all expect can definitely really hurt a player's ability to consistently contribute when they do get minutes um, because they're not sure if this will be the only stint of the game that they get or the only game they play in that week and they might want to you know overthink things so I think that if you get a more relaxed launcher that knows his role has a consistent role whether that's you know off the bench for 15 20 minutes as a starter for 25 minutes or something like that you'll probably get and, and if he can stay healthy obviously you'll probably get someone who can average anywhere from 11 to 13 points a game, anywhere from five to seven rebounds a game. And what you would hope for is probably someone who can shoot over 36% from three, which again, we can talk about this in a little bit. Some of the questions uh, that we got addressed this, but given if you can get them at a reduced salary, this, this, uh, this off season, because of the circumstances, that's a, you know, that could be a pretty valuable player. I, I agree completely. I think in fact, that almost knocks to a question. I want to address one other piece with you first before I hit one question here in the mailbag, but um. Just D'Angelo Russell. I mean, you talk about not being too high on him. I I mean, he was drafted by the Lakers. I always have a soft spot for my man D'Lo. Um, bounced around, you know, Brooklyn, uh, spent half a season up in uh, Golden State, and then came over and played 12 games for Minnesota. Averaged 21 points, uh, four rebounds, four and a half rebounds, six and a half assists, um, 41% from the field, 34% from three. You know, I, I think 
I was optimistic of initially about the pairing between Russell and Towns. I think that there is a chance for a dynamic offensive attack between those two. Defensively, it's going to be bad because D'Angelo Russell kind of struggles the perimeter, and Carlton Towns isn't like the greatest defender. And I, I don't think I'm exaggerating too much, but um, <laughs> no, I'm playing. But um, I am a lot more hopeful of Russell's fit long term in Minnesota. I don't know if, and this is my one concern. I don't know if you have Russell in towns as the foundation of a winning team i think he's a starter for sure i don't really under you know as a combo guard or whatever his his role is um for them but for the timberwolves best su- chance to succeed moving forward to potentially be a contending team which is definitely probably not next year you know maybe the year after that but they obviously want to get to that especially you know carl Anthony towns and having to watch out for his situation um what do you think about DeAndre Russell's fit in Minnesota? Because I'm overly optimistic thinking that he's in a system that is better for him, at least on the offensive end. I don't know if there's a scheme in place to hide his defensive struggles. In fact, I'm not fairly confident in that at all. But, um, like, what are your thoughts on Russell in general um, in Minnesota? I, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, kind of what you said. Like, there definitely seems – it's definitely the ecosystem, I think, for him to thrive offensively. Um as it is for like a Beasley and a Hernan Gomez. Uh, the team wants to shoot a lot of threes. Um, the ball will be at his hands with Towns as an elite pick and pop and pick and roll player. Um, and then, you know, hopefully, you know, obviously we'll have to see how the offseason develops for them. They set, they surround them with, with, you know, capable shooters, some cutters, some people who can help on the offensive glass. And then you, you go from there. Um, you know, his numbers in Minnesota were, around what they've been for the past, you know, since his kind of breakout all-star year in Brooklyn, um, around, you know, league average true shooting, you know, almost, you know, 22 points a game, a little bit over six assists. Um, you know, the tough thing with the post-deadline Timberwolves is that there was almost no time spent with Russell and Towns because Towns was hurt. And so that makes it really hard to get any sense of evaluation, you know, at least for Beasley and Hernan Gomez, uh, we got like 14 games worth, which is, you know, small, but it's something. And Russell played in 12 games, but only one of those games came with Towns. So it's 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 really hard to, to say how well they can do with that duo at the one and five. Like you said, it should be, you know, that plus enough shooting and just a good system will probably be a, a good offense. But like you said, I mean, the defense with them at the one and five spots is really, really like you're going to have to surround them with some elite defenders and it's, it's interesting because it was the conversation that people had what one or two years ago with the nuggets like <laughs> you know comparing you know if you have murray and Jokic two years ago everyone was saying okay well if that's your one and that's your five you have to have elite defenders around them and i think both of those guys have taken steps defensively uh, i think Jokic's defense was always overblown i think he's always been a positive defender just not a good a good one just above average um and Murray has taken some steps there, and they surrounded them with a guy like a Paul Millsap and a Gary Harris who has improved a lot, and Will Barton has become solid enough. And that the result was um, the past two seasons, the Nuggets have been top 12 in defensive rating. So what the question you know, for me is, for this core to succeed, for Russell and Towns to succeed, what kind of defenders will they have around them? And if they can get those defenders, you start believing it a little more. If you go in all in with Russell, Beasley, Towns, you bring back Wancho, Culver doesn't make a big step, you know, then you're looking at a team that's going to be probably really good offensively, but a train wreck on defense. And it's really hard to compete with that kind of uh, imbalance on both ends. Yeah, I have to agree with you. Defensively uh, is a struggle already. Obviously, we know that for the Timberwolves, but it's something that they should hope to address this this offseason. Um because it's an issue. We just talked about Russell. Um, and I feel like, okay, he's only 24. He still has room to grow. I think more of that growing, though, I'm not going to fall into the Wiggins trap I did two years ago. <laughs> I, think, I think more of that growing is just in terms of shot making. He's proven himself to be a pretty good high volume scorer. Um, he has a decent three point shot. He's a solid passer. But defensively, like you said, um, according to basketballreference.com, all five of his seasons, he's at a defensive rating of 110 or higher, which. Which, which isn't good. So, like, you know, you definitely want to work on uh, – definitely want to make that a focus. And you're right. When you have Beasley who, you know, he'll, he'll stay in front of his man, but he's undersized, um, you know, just to generate against bigger wins. Uh, Russell's not going to give you any versatility there. And then you're right. Like, in the front court, Wancho's serviceable, but Carnley Towns isn't the anchor you want defensively. They need to make a focus on um, acquiring some guys that 
they can use to to shore that end up a little bit, if not even passably. You know, I'm not saying like a defensive maestro out there, um, but but someone out there who can kind of tighten it up a little because otherwise they'll be just giving up as many points as they score, which would be a fun league pass team, but uh, I can't really speak much more of that. Um, which <laughs> actually, I'll go to the first question. So we already covered uh, – Actually, we didn't even really go into. I guess we have to cover. I'm ready to go in this question, but um, w- he had an injury riddle year. He's had a long year. I really feel it's just been a, a rough year in general. But Carl Anthony Towns, obviously the centerpiece of the Timberwolves, um, easily uh, one of the most efficient, versatile offensive big men in the game. Uh, and just obviously defensively, his struggles are there. But the dude is a beast, and I think now he's in a situation where he has a friend and a point guard there for him. Um, you know setting him up and helping alongside and you have a coaching staff that we could kind of talk about later, but I'm, I'm pretty positive. I think that injuries more than anything kind of derailed a season that and just a, a horrible defense that kind of knocked them from the jump. But any thoughts on Carl Anthony Towns and just the season that he's had um, this past year? And I can just kind of run through the numbers, played 35 games, 26 points, 10 rebounds and 4.4 assists a night on a uh, 50% shooting 41% from the field. Um, and say 9% from the free throw line, just versatile and, and just efficient at all levels. Um, the assist per game through this point is a career high, uh, solid on the rebounding and also a career high so far, at least this season, um, for points per game. So he just stepped up and yeah, obviously 35 games isn't a huge sample size um, and injuries did play a big part, but um, the, the man is a monster. I mean, yeah, there's there's almost – there's not that many things to say about him offensively because there's almost – there's nothing he can't do. I mean, nope. you can't switch on him because he'll punish a smaller defender in the post. You can't uh, not guard him on deep because he just shot 41% from three on almost eight attempts per game That's from insane. beyond the arc. It's the, best, it's the best It's the best shooting season from a, a true big man center of all time. I mean, that kind of volume on that percentage is uh, is absurd. So, and, you know, he, he can, he's not an elite playmaker. Like, I don't think his vision of, like, reading the court is, like, elite. But, like you said, he can find open shooters. He can find some cutters. You know, you don't average almost four and a half assists per game by accident. So... <laughs> I mean, he's not like a guy who's going to break. He's not like a Nikola Jokic passer, but he can, if you double him, he can find somebody. And that's key, obviously, as well, because there have obviously been big men, like maybe like an Embiid, who struggle when they get double teamed to really have that vision to see out. But that's not the case with Towns. Offensively, you can't ask for anything more than what he's doing now. The only question is, can he and will he get enough, better enough defensively for this team to be good enough on that end to be a true contender for a playoff spot because the offense is great and you know maybe he'll have he can do less offensively now with with better surrounding talent and that can help him defensively we'll we'll obviously have to see but the only questions with him moving forward is is on the defensive end because clearly he has proven for years now that he is one of if not the most dominant offensive big mans in the league and one of them of all time yeah I mean watching him in just it's crazy I think Minnesota the last what 10 years have been just blessed with these offensive offensively versatile centers or big men you had kevin love for a number of years you know and then and then basically transition right over to towns now towns is a whole nother level in my opinion just because you said that kevin love was no slouch of a shooter still isn't but at this point this early i mean towns putting it all together and it is crazy to see like you said the big struggle is on the defensive end and that's kind of <laughs> the name of the game for minnesota offensively i'm not too worried. It should be kind of fun. Although there are some question marks that we'll kind of get to. But um, that kind of leads us to our first question um, from Zach Nolan. Outside, we already mentioned Kat, D'Lo, and Malik. I'm going to throw this to you first, Eric. You're the guest. I get to do this. Who's the <laughs> most important piece of the team outside of those three? Kat, D'Angelo Russell, and Malik Beasley, who we're just assuming, we'll talk about more later, is going to be re-signed. Yeah, um, I think, you know, you're asking – this to me now, I'm going to have to probably say still Jared Culver. Um, yep. If you ask me in October, I might be going, I might have picked the, whoever they draft with their top pick. Um, I think Culver still has to be the answer here. Obviously, he just finished his rookie season. Uh, he's 21, so he's not, you know, one of the super young rookies. Um, but he obviously, rookie seasons can be pretty bad sometimes. And his was certainly had his fair share of struggles, to say the <laughs> least. Um, yes. But, you know... Given his size, some additional playmaking, you know, 
the fact that he was a, 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 a pretty high pick last year, you have to kind of go with him as, as the most important behind uh, Towns, Russell, and Beasley. Um, you know, just to run through some of his numbers from the rookie season, he had a 19% usage, um, but only a 46.7% true shooting, which is, you know, well, well, well oh, below sure. league average. Uh, 30% on threes is concerning, as is the 46% from the free throw line, um, which is, is not great for trying to project how much of a, how good of a shooter he's going to be, um, which, you know, I'll just get to now is probably a key thing. I know we have another question that's kind of related to this yeah. about, um, <laughs> I'll just say it now so we know what it is, but um, it's yeah. what's the what's the thing Jared Culver has to work on the most moving forward? And wow. this Jackson, shout out to him. <laughs> yeah, it's a, good, it's a good question because I think there's a couple of things, obviously, but he says, you know, what does he have to work on the most? And what's interesting is given what the team added in Russell and Beasley and obviously having Towns and, you know, a top pick in this year's draft that might be someone who needs shots, it might be shooting for Culver because, you know, this season he – was kind of like a uh, – they kind of put him in a, in a ball handling role. as kind of like a point guard, point wing, et cetera, um, which he, he was okay at. Um, I think would be good for his development. But, mm-hmm. you know, you look at that 30% three-point shooting and his free throw shooting and you're concerned there. And he was a 34% shooter in college so from three. So given that D'Lo and Towns and Beasley and, you know, potentially another pick that's in the top three of this year's draft – that they're probably going to all want the ball or all want their shots, it probably means there's going to be more time spent off the ball for Culver, which means he needs to become a threat from deep for defenses to really trust, uh, honor him and and kind of guard him at the perimeter. The last thing you want is to him to be uh, such a negative from deep that that teams can send an extra player at Towns or crowd the paint on drives for Russell or Beasley or whoever they pick this year's draft. Like that for me, given their team and given what they added recently – I think him becoming an above average three point shooter would be better for their team than say a a, a more ball dominant wing who only shoots thirty percent from beyond the arc. No, I completely agree. Culver had an up and down season, like you said, and it's weird because that three point shot you mentioned it. I'm going to second that. That seems to be the key um, determinator on on how where his role will be on this team because the Timberwolves took the third most three point attempts per game, three point shots. And they were third worst in three point percentage, so <laughs> they're gonna they're gonna fire them up. But you're right, that accuracy obviously is key. You want to get it up, you you want to knock more of them down. And the thing for Culver, you know, it reminded me almost of the way the Lakers developed Brandon Ingram early in his first two seasons, where they had him play more of a point guard role, despite that not being his position. You know what I mean? Just the size, mm-hmm. kind of using that 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 height, um, try to develop those tendencies and and those um those skills. And so Culver played a lot of that. Um, but the problem was, I mean, you have another guard um, who came, I think he was on a two-way contract. We mentioned him a little earlier, um, Jordan McLaughlin. Mm-hmm. Now, he started 35 of his games, but his production, you set nine points, 3.4 rebounds, 1.7 assists. That's not that's not horrible, especially not for a rookie. But McLaughlin, seven points, just, over, just under two rebounds a game and 4.2 assists per game. And he's seven inches shorter. And he's also averaging four fewer minutes. McLaughlin is then Culver and has played half the number of games. So you're getting more of what you're looking for in that backup point guard spot, despite, you know, in, in less minutes, in less time, um, despite certain advantages. Now, mind you, I don't hold all of that together because McLaughlin's a little older, had more experience than Culver, who, you know, he's seen different schemes, getting used to different um, defensive strategies or defensive um, zones and such in the NBA. So I give some of that to a, a learning curve there, but let's say you put him behind, obviously you put him behind D'Angelo Russell, and then let's put him behind McLaughlin, because McLaughlin, who is restricted free agent of the season, also played really, really strong as a backup guard down the stretch. So fine, he's the third spot in the point guard rotation. But if you put him in the shooting guard rotation, like you said, he's behind Malik Beasley for certain, but that's not his best fit, because one, his three-point shot, like you said, under 30%, and two, you know, he's better actually at starting a fast break than he is at, like, finishing one and being a, a, a slasher on that end. I think um, I put this number out of all of his driving shots this season. He shot just 46%. If you take dunks out of that, that average falls to 38%. And then obviously, you know, the farther you go away from the basket, the more it drops. So that's the the crazy part. Um, you know, he has good size, 6'6", 195 pounds, good frame. Um, but that three-point shot is very troubling. 
I, I don't know. I think, you know, he's going to be – This I guess this brings me to another guy who I'm kind of worried about um, in terms of playing, which is Josh Koji, mm-hmm. who I don't want them to all project as, like, swingman energy players who maybe can knock down some threes but not really and have the size to play effective defense but don't always do it or or don't consistently do it at all um who don't bring you much else but they have potential you know like like it's a bunch of question marks in the air for for players who have to swing between multiple desi- um positions because you already have your starting backcourt entrenched and for that small four position i could see you platooning um, you know, Culver or Koji or, or whoever you draft out there. But I would assume, and we'll get to that later with the draft, that whoever you pick um, in the offseason would be the person starting there. Um, but actually, that nails um, the question, like you said, from Lazarus Jackson. The one thing he needs to work on moving forward, we mentioned it twice, shooting. You know, obviously, working on his defense, it wasn't super great. But again, as a rookie, I mean, I don't know if, that, if that's expected. Um, you know, he averaged, what, less than a steal in a block per game while playing under 20, 25 minutes. So, you know, as he gets more, or he, he, I mean, he, that is a part where he actually was good at. As he gets more time, you can only expect that to go on. Um, and that's positive. But the offensive end, you know, that's what's going to keep him, um, not only consistent minutes, but also make him stand out on a team that needs shooting and size, which presumably Culver can bring. Yeah. And the, and the defense, you know, uh, just looking at cleaning the glass, the, the team's defense was better with him on the floor than – so it was 2.7 points per 100 possessions better when he was on the court, um, which ranked in the 71st percentile. So for a rookie wing, you know, that, that's good. Um, I think I think defense is – again, yeah, like you said, it's almost like you don't want him to just fall into what, you know, Josh Akogi has, bought, has become, which is like, all right, you know, good defensive energy player, can't really shoot – um, you don't want that because, you know, that's kind of concerning. But defense, at least for now, is the, is the skill or the side of the ball that you project Culver the best in. Uh, and now, like we said, it comes down to the shooting. And more importantly, you know, what the shooting factors into the more important question of how can he fit in with this new look team, um, which has more ball handlers and, you know, will have more people that want shots. Exactly. I agree. And, and while we, you know, talk about Suman, let's talk about Josh Okoji for a second here. Um, 6'4", um, he played, what, this past game, um, or this past season, uh, 25 minutes a night, 8 points, 4.3 rebounds, 1.6 assists, 42% from the field, yikes, 26% from three, um, and 79% from the free throw line. So um, he improved um, in points, rebounds, assists, and field goal percentage, which is crazy that, you know, he 42% is an improvement. But, I mean, this is his second season. Um, and he, he was a guy who was active. But, again, um, just the shooting was rough. He had one 10-game stretch from December 20th through January 7th in which he shot two for 22 from three. Um, and, and that's brutal. <laughs> and, like, it, it's crazy. Um, defensively, again, another guy who, like Hover, has – Serious potential on that end. Um, very good energy. Um, he forced a ton of mid-range shots from opponents and allowed just 46% shooting from that area. Um, he did a great job defending most teams' best players. And, and mind you, the trade deadline helped him in some ways because he had less offensive responsibility. And after that, he averaged nine points and um, just under two assists per game while shooting 50% from the field, 35% from three, and 84% from the line um, over those last 14 games. So maybe this is just a sign of him having to do less and being more efficient in that role. And maybe the more he had to do, you know, the, the farther the efficiency fell. But even if that's the case, that is a brutal stretch. Going two for 22 from three in any stretch is, is pretty bad. Um, shooting 26% from the three is horrible. But um, again, you have another energy guy who can play uh, decently effective defense and needs to work on his shot. What, what do you think about uh, Koji, <laughs> Eric? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it might be another case where the shooting and lack of offensive skill, you know, prohibits him from being, um, you know, a starter, heavy minutes kind of guy. Um, you mentioned he, he he did start, I think, almost like 30 games this year, and he you yeah. know, played a good amount of minutes. But, you know, when you're projecting the next playoff, the next t- Timberwolves team that's going to make the playoffs, which I'm, I, I'm sure that they hope that that's next season – um, but, you know, it might be the, the season after you're probably projecting a team that has 
Um, you know, if it's someone who is at the same caliber defensively on the wing, that someone that player brings a little bit more shooting or, you know, just can't be as much of a liability on one end of the floor. Um, you know, we'll have to see again. Like I said, it's so tough to evaluate this team because we didn't really see them at full strength at all post uh, trade deadline. Um, but, you know, the offense, you know, you've got if you have Russell Towns and Beasley on the court together. The question will will probably have to be, you know, how good are those three, you know, offensively? Like, can you have those three on the court offensively with one of Culver or Kogi and and just be, you know, still really good offensively and then just, you know, say that you'll sacrifice one of your five starting spots just for elite defense? Or will, you know, one of those wings bring down the offense so much that you have to replace them in the starting lineup? And that's a question we can't answer because we didn't see Russell Towns and Beasley play together for more than one game. True, true. You're right. That sample size is small, and it's crazy when you say that because out of those few, you know, um, well, one of them in Beasley definitely is, is going to have to be. It's 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 sad because you get the full you get the full pieces that you're looking forward to, but injuries come in, and like with Ernan Gomez, with Beasley, some of those guys. Hey, off season is here. We need to decide whether or not to bring them back, and that's what makes it tough because you're right. You have these moving pieces that have to be evaluated, and some of them. Are, are equal parts integral to future plans and also first have to be part of the future. So um, with that, I guess I'm actually going to go to another question. And we kind of talked about this a little bit, so we'll be quick. Um, it's from the assistant to the general manager um, at to the GM. And and by the way, I already gave shout out to Lazarus Jackson, but between uh, Lazarus and um, to the GM, these guys have two really good podcasts. One is called the assistant to the general manager and one is called Pistons versus everybody. Um, really good. I would definitely check those out. But this question is, with um, Wancho and Beasley being key pieces and the Covington team on both restricted, do you have a walkway number for either, or do you think they should just resign, resign them regardless? Um, obviously, I'm not going to give you a number, Eric, because like you said, with the cap in, in such flux with everything going on, I wouldn't even know what that number would be, um, market value, between what it was going to be heading into um, the shutdown. But I, I'm just going to kind of modify the question a little bit. Unless you unless you have a walkway number that you think, in light of the situation, you would adjust on the fly. But you would bring both of those players back, right? Um, I mean, I try really hard to bring Beasley back. I would try, you know, decently hard to bring Wancho back. Um, okay. But uh, you know, it, yeah, like you said, it's hard to find an exact number. If I was ba- if I was basing it off of what we thought the cap was going to be, I'd say anything above like eight million, I think, per year for Wancho is probably a number I might, you know, let him walk. <laughs> a little rich. Um, I think that, you know, I think that he's a good player. Um, obviously, I mentioned his numbers in those 14 games that were, you know, you know, really impressive. Um, but, you know, if you're if, if someone gives him an offer where it's, you know, four years, 40, and I'm not saying there's going to be that offer. But if, if in a normal situation there was an offer for four years, 40, you know, I might just solely focus on on bringing back Beasley. And for Beasley, if it was a normal cap situation, I probably would be comfortable matching upwards of 16 or 17 million dollars a year. Um, that might sound rich to to some people, um, and obviously, we don't know if he can replicate those those numbers he averaged over the 14 games for an entire season. Mm-hmm. But uh, he's a great athlete. He's I think 23 um, and uh, an elite three point shooter. And I think and I think. I think his work ethic is one that he's only going to try and continue improving. He's going to try and improve defensively. Um, he's going to try and, you know, figure out better ways to, you know, position himself for catch and shoot opportunities. He's going to try and improve himself as a ball handler so he can run some pick and roll. So I, I believe really, I believe a lot in his work ethic um, and the existing skills to feel comfortable matching upwards of 16 or $17 million per year. But that was in a normal situation. I don't think that kind of offer is going to come now that teams, less teams have salary cap and um, the cap might be dropping itself. So those are, those are numbers that I thought of uh, for like a normal situation. No, I'm actually right there with you on both. I would actually even go a little higher for Beasley just for his importance on the direction offensively um, that the Timbers are going. And the fact that with his youth, youth excuse me, yes, 23 being able to grow alongside um, Carl Anthony Towns and um, DeAndre Russell as that young core with Akogi and uh, Culver. So I would buy in a lot more on Beasley. I think that he fits a position of real need. Or Wancho, you know, yes, he's good. Um, you already gave a, a decent um, – number that you could go up to and that would be nice if he gets anything more than that congratulations young fella get your money but um that would be all that would be where i'm at on that especially when you can look out 
into uh you know any free agents and, and probably find um some similar fits either for a little cheaper or or better fits that obviously would cost more but fit um more ideally next to Carl Anthony Towns but um that that for sure is one I was um curious about and then um I, I, I'm trying to figure out the next place to go here. What do you think as far as uh, off season? You think we should look at the draft now or free agency? I want to kind of transition now, having covered some of the team and some of the the key pieces here. Um, let, you know, let's just do the draft. Let's do the draft. We'll go. We'll go in order for now. Um, but looking at this team, um, what needs, Eric? Do you think obviously are needed? Um, I just could thought just power forward in general. But I know knowing you in attention to detail, what specific um, positions of need are you looking for the Timberwolves to fill? Uh, I mean, I think that, you know, to player types to target in the draft would definitely be wings and yep. defense and a defensive big. Um, you know, I don't spend a lot of time watching the draft. Um, so I don't yeah. know a lot of the, I know the prospects names and some of <laughs> and, and their skill sets. And I've, I've looked into some more than others, but the type of player is, listen, I mean, you know, obviously, three and D wings are, are hard to find, and, and three and D wings at an, a, an elite level are really hard to find. But if you can try and target a wing that can be really good defensively and you know passable as a three point shooter and offensive cutter and things like that, that has to be a priority, I think. And then also, you know, like I said, finding a defensive big. And, and the thing with the Timberwolves, which is interesting, is that because Towns, like we talked about before, had you know one of the best, if not the best big man shooting seasons of all time, you can actually feel somewhat comfortable penciling in a non-shooter at the four if they're going to bring elite defense and, re- and rebounding and rim protection because with Towns' ability to, to you know shoot 40% on, on eight three-pointer attempts per game, mm-hmm. you don't feel like you're sacrificing that much offensively. You can still run pick and pops with him. Whereas most teams, their centers you know, already don't shoot. So if you have a, a four that can't shoot, then you're really in trouble spacing-wise. But the, sure. the Timberwolves don't have that issue, which is kind of a luxury for them as they target potentially some t- defensive big men's in the draft or, you know, like, as we'll probably get to, you know, some defensive front court players in free agency that might struggle with their shot. Um, but if they bring enough to the table defensively, you feel comfortable with Towns' ability to space the floor and run pick and pop that it would work out. Oh, most definitely. No, I I agree completely with that. In fact, um, for me, I'm thinking the same thing as you. A wing for sure. Uh, already mentioned a power forward, and we could kind of talk about that in free agency, or I even have a spicy idea. But real quick, if if I'm just starting my draft coverage the same as you are, as far as like <laughs> digging deep and you know looking at the scouting reports, I've seen some in passing and some in full regards for you know the Suns I've been writing about and things of that nature. But in terms of just general players and what teams they could fill in. Um, that's still something I'm working on. But as far as a small forward, you know, I think if the Timberwolves have the opportunity, I go for Anthony Edwards. Um, Hmm. I think that he's bulky enough. I think he's 6'4". I'm looking right now just to make sure. But he has a frame enough that I could see him playing small forward um, or or coming in alongside and, and kind of bumping up on some of those wings. Offensively, the dude can fill it up for sure. And I think that he would fit in right with the starting lineup. I the only worry I have is that he might go a little too early. But for me, um, yeah, I'm I'm all on Anthony Edwards as someone who, while while ideally is not a, a quote unquote wing, someone who could play that route and then also swing different positions. Six five, two twenty five. I think he definitely has enough size and definitely the frame to hold up. And offensively, you're getting another just guy who can just fill it up real quick. He reminds me almost like a Donovan Mitchell um, from out there um, or just playing. He shot this past season, you know, not super great from three, 30 per, just under 30% on seven attempts a night, um, averaged 19 points, five rebounds, and just under three assists a night. But he was playing on a Georgia team that I, I couldn't get a chance to look at them really well. It didn't look like they had the greatest of teams. And so I'd imagine some of that was just poor shot selection. You bring them in a team where I, I doubt you'll get better shot selection per se from Minnesota with the way they jack up the shots. But He's another guy who's a solid playmaker, can further uh, diversify the Timbo's offense. I would go for him uh, first and foremost. Yeah, I would have. Uh, that's interesting. I, I would have too many concerns with him being a ball dominant kind of guard or, or wing with pairing him with a guy like Russell and Towns. Like Russell can shoot off the ball, and you know we saw him with the in play in that Warrior system for half a season, and you know run off screens and things like that. But I think I don't know. I'm, I'm not sold on Edwards um, fitting in well 
like with a team that's not giving him the ball like regularly and letting him develop that way. Um, I feel like it might be a weird fit offensively and defensively, you know, he might have the, the physicality, but again, like you said, you know, he's kind of, you know, well, pretty undersized in terms of height for the three. And, you know, you know, obviously the league is trending smaller nowadays and, you know, that's not yeah. always a huge concern and there aren't too many of the elite wings that you have to guard anymore. But for me, it, I would have concerns defensively when you're, you know, you've got Russell, who's a negative on that, and Beasley, you know, probably can be average, but it's actually, you know, still a little bit undersized. Towns, we think, is a negative or, you know, probably average at best. We don't know who their power forward would be, I guess, theoretically. And then slotting Edwards at the three, I mean, I think the size and the limitations, you know, in terms of that on that end of the floor would be a little bit too concerning for me. But here's the other thing about the Timberwolves pick is that Mm -hmm. a lot of the top wing players in the draft, at least that I've been reading about, are, are not projected to go as high as the Timberwolves are projected to draft. And yeah. the other thing is, you know, the Timberwolves are not a team where they're, they're, they sh- they're not above drafting the best available player. If the best available player when they are drafting is LaMelo Ball at three or four or two or whatever, you, this team should still be drafting the best available Whoa. player. Whoa, you, you think LaMelo Ball, though? I, I mean, I, I, I would I would I, draft the best available player and and figure it out from there. I'd rather do that than overreach for a wing who you know would probably go tenth, but because the Timberwolves feel like they're ready for the playoffs, would draft him at three, for example. Like that yeah. is something I wouldn't do. But my, my one of my players that I like for the Timberwolves that I think should go this high anyways, and I'm going to butcher the pronunciation is Onyeka Okongwu from okay. USC. This yep. guy is a defensive monster. I mean, he, he's 6'9", 245. Um, and like I said before, he can play the power forward, and I wouldn't feel uncomfortable about it because of Towns' is elite three-point shooting. And this guy, um, Onyeka's stats, I'm telling you, in his rookie season at USC, 2.7 blocks per game uh, in 30 minutes per game, uh, average 16 points, 8.6 rebounds. Um, but this guy provides elite defensive ability. Um, he can switch. Uh, he can protect the rim. Um, I, ju- I just love what he can bring defensively. And I think that he's a guy that warrants taking in the first you know, three to four picks of this draft. And if you're the Timberwolves, you need defense. You need a guy in the front court. You need a guy who can be versatile on that end and not just provide one defensive skill. That, that's someone to look into. Um, you know, Maybe over instead of reaching for a wing that might go 10th, you take a big who I think a lot of people do have him projected in somewhere in the top five or six. So that's someone I'm, I, I would be looking at intensely if I were the Timberwolves. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I, I mean, here's my thing. I guess I disagree slightly with the draft strategy in terms of if they have, you're right, best player available. I just put one caveat, and that's if it's in the backcourt. I don't think Russell or um, Malik Beasley are, are the perfect fit. I don't think with those two, you go, okay, that's the backcourt. You know, that's going to lead us wherever. But for the Timberwolves, if you're going to invest in um, Beasley, which I imagine they are, and you already made the trade to bring in Russell, I don't think you're bringing another guard like LaMelo or who plays kind of the same exact way, in my opinion, that Russell does. Or, or Cole Anthony. But I see what you mean. I, I, I agree with you up to a point. Position you need anywhere. I just I don't know if I would mess with the guard spot just because of the guys that for better or for worse, are entrenched there moving forward, at least for the next year or two. You know what I mean? Then I can see them kind of evaluating on it. But I, I couldn't see them souring on Russell so fast that they draft somebody to be like a heir apparent when you also already have Malik there, you know? Well, yeah. I, I, for, well, I think, first of all, I'm more ruthless than you are. When it comes to <laughs> <I think so. laughs> um the other thing I'll say is, um, you know, the, the league is trending to having multiple, you know, ball handlers on the court anyways. And so if, the, if, the, if a guard is who many consider to be the best available player on the board when the Timberwolves are up, um, I think that the league is trending to more ball handlers. Definitely, it's definitely trending to more, you know, multi-guard, three-guard lineups, um, things of that nature. And plus, you get someone into your team you know, this year that you can develop for a year or two. And then, like you said, you know, hey, in a year or two, they evaluate things. This draft pick, this guard, whoever it is, LaMelo Ball, you know, Tyrese uh, Halliburton, whatever. Um, th- if that player in one to two years has really shown a lot and you're looking around and saying, you know, maybe we can move on for Russell, trade him for a wing or something like that, or trade Beasley for a wing or something like that. Like, I- I'd rather have more bites at the apple to figure it out, Um rather than trying to draft for, for need at this point. You know, 
And of course, they don't have their pick next year. But next year, to me, would seem more like a time to draft for need after a year of development and cohesion and things like that. Whereas at this point in this draft in October, I still think they should be drafting just just pure talent, um, almost regardless of what the position is. And then you you get more bites at the apple that way, and you, and you can try new unique things and be more innovative offensively and, and go from there. But again, I'm I'm sorry. I I should have known all these years we talked about team strategy. You're like, hey, cut it off. I'm like, this is a podcast with me for like a year and a half, and you don't know how ruthless I am yet. <laughs> I know, man. I'm a mess. <laughs> but no, I'm with you. Um, I think we gave some good, uh, potential uh, draft picks. Um, I don't know if it slips that far, but I would love Obi Toppin on this team. Yeah, I offensively that'd be great. Uh, but again, from what I've read and what I've seen of him, he, defense is not exactly a calling card. Uh, and <laughs> you know, if you if you add a fourth negative defender to that starting lineup, uh, you might you might be thirtieth in defense. I should mention also that I, I forgot to mention it earlier, but I looked it up. You know what they did post trade deadline. Obviously, they didn't have towns for almost all of it, so it's not really relevant. But they went yeah. four and ten and were sixteenth on offense and 29th on defense according to Cleaning the Glass. So, mm-hmm. you know, just want to mention oh, yeah. that now while I <laughs> while I talk about Obi Toppin's bad defense. But uh, offensively, that'd be really intriguing. Um, obviously, I think. We all, we have, anyone who's read up on him or watched some of his film can see what he can do offensively. Um, yeah. Just to me, there's too many defensive concerns to draft him. Uh, he's also 22, so you get that kind of like, I'm not trying to, you know, be biased because of age, but you yeah. know, so, it is sometimes nice to draft, you know, players that are 19 or 20 where you can project a little bit more natural uh, development. Yeah, no, I feel you. I get you. I guess for me, I was thinking more of like, uh, a guy who was ready, uh, and again, this is where my timeline's going. Not win now, but okay, he's 22. You're right in the middle of Carl Anthony Towns' age and um, D'Angelo Russell right next to Beasley, like, grow together. But I see what you're saying, especially with a team that, let's not rush the process. They are uh, young. And, yeah, I'm looking I'm looking again now in Obi Top, and you're right, defensively and foot speed-wise, that'd be a mess. It'd be like the 91 Denver Nuggets, just all <laughs> offense, baby. <laughs> like, <laughs> only time they play defense when they inbound the ball. No, exactly. But, uh, <laughs> All right, so I feel like we moved on, moving on. I've there. got one. I got one yeah. more. I got one more draft prospect to tell you. Ooh. This is a guy. Listen, anyone who's followed me on Twitter, <laughs> and the only draft prospect I have actually talked about on my Twitter is Paul Reed. This is I a guy who was projected this. in the second round, and the Timberwolves, you know, their second round pick is going to be, I think, like 30, 33 uh, in that range. Um, and this guy is, listen, he's not like an elite. Um, He's, he's not someone you can, like, slot in and, like, oh, my God, this guy's going to fix your defense. There's concerns about his three-point shot. Um, but what he did at, at DePaul in his junior year, so he's 21, so he's not, he's not you know, a young rookie, uh, 15 points per game, uh, almost 11 rebounds per game. But the numbers, two, uh, 1.9 steals per game and 2.6 blocks per game. And uh, I think he was the only player, uh, the only other player to average those numbers uh, were, were Ner- was Nerlens Noel, who obviously when he was entering the league was projected as a number one pick before he got hurt. Um, again, the, the jump shot, he's a, a career 33 percent from three, um, but he takes almost he, he took almost two per game this past year and he shot 74 percent from the free throw line. In his, in his three years at DePaul. And you, you just watch this guy, some of his film. Um, you know, he, he, he's a great athlete, um, can protect the rim, can be active in the passing lanes, got good, good size and wingspan. Um, he's 6'9", 220. I think he has a seven-foot wingspan. Um, you know, this is a guy who I think if, if team, whichever team drafts him, I think, I think he's probably going to end up falling to the middle of the second round. And I think a team that gets him there would have a, a massive steal. So kind of like... Uh, Okongwu, who I just talked about, he's a guy, Reed, who slots in as a four or, or a five that doesn't bring much shooting, um, but boy, does he bring c- some kind of excitement on the defensive end that you can work around given Towns' is shooting. Wow, that's a good one. I have not done a lot of looking into Paul Reed aside from, I think, the, one or two. <laughs> he's the only guy I really watched like, that much film on. <laughs> I was going to say, the only time I probably vaguely remember is from seeing a tweet of yours across <laughs> my timeline. I'm like, okay. <laughs> like, yeah, you definitely got to put that there. Wow, well, that that for for, for, for now at least is a, a, a nice little, um, I guess, gathering of possible prospects. And again, you know, we expect them to draft 
relatively high, but we're not exactly sure where and the direction that they will take. But those are a few names. You know, keep out for Paul Reed, Timberwolves fans. Like, <laughs> like that dude's a sleeper pick for sure. But um, moving more into free agency um, trades, um, obviously we're talking about forwards. I'm going to throw mine out and then give you um, a platform, obviously, to, to talk about what ideas you would um, pursue either through free agency or trades. But for me, I'm looking for that forward position. And, and if I was – you know, in the front office of the Minnesota Timberwolves. They just heard an episode of my podcast and said, listen, you need to come to the front office. I'd be like, I don't know, man, my Wi-Fi is bad. No, I'd come in. <laughs> so, I mean, if that was the case, what I would have done or what I would do is, I already said, Edwards or some type of wing to kind of get the small forward or another position there. And then I would target a power forward, um, either in free agency or th- through trades. If they have some um, lineup versatility or flexibility there, the, the better. Um I guess one idea, and I want to toss it to you since it's someone who is actually on your team. Um, I really think that the Timberwolves should pursue Jeremy Grant. Uh, I thought you were, were going to go in a different direction, actually, of someone else who's already on the Nuggets so that plays power forward, and I would have been very, very oh, saddened by oh, it. Mill <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yeah. Millsap? Yeah, well, listen, I, I don't think that would happen, but I think Millsap's skill set maybe a couple of years ago would be perfect next to Towns, almost like what he did when he came to Denver to pair next to Jokic, um, which is, it's again, it's very interesting that this this Timberwolves team is, is a lot like, uh, it's maybe a, a later stage version of the Nuggets from two years ago, where their one in five are the core pieces. Um, the, now, back two years ago, the Nuggets one and five were you know twenty one and twenty two years old, and now Russell and Towns are, are a little bit older than that. But it's still you've got the one and five locked in on their big contracts. They're your core, your fran- the faces of the franchise. You've got a couple of, of guards and wings around them, like the Nuggets had with Gary Harris, Will Barton, etc. But you, now you're looking for uh, a, a true wing and or a power forward that can help on the defensive end and the Nuggets they got Millsap for that and what you've seen is a team that's you know jumped up obviously their current players have already progressed um, but adding Millsap was a huge part of them taking the next step and it's kind of funny how we're talking about that with the same way with the Timberwolves team who are looking for you know a wing and a power forward that can help on the defensive end and Grant is an interesting one because his age timeline you know, he's 25, so he fits, yep. you know, he fits perfectly. That, that was the mindset when the Nuggets traded for him last year is that he fits perfectly with their core. Um, all the indications have been that they want to re-sign him. Uh, he's got a player option that he, he said he's going to decline. Um, but again, you know, th- once, once the true cap number is revealed, there might be a, a, a thought that he should just pick it up and, and re-enter next summer, which might be good for him. Uh, that player option is for a little bit over $9 million, which – it might be hard to get much more than that on a per year basis in this in this market, but you know he he does project as as a good fit. Um, his numbers in Denver, you know, he, his three point shooting was even better than it was the the, pre, the prior season. Um, but the shot blocking numbers, the rebounding numbers, and the kind of on off metrics were were much more disappointing than you would have expected when the Nuggets traded for him. So he's somewhere where. I'm not sure if he if his skill set or his him alone will be able to kind of make that improvement the way that Millsap improved the Nuggets defense. But given his age and his three point shooting, that would would help the offense and his athleticism. You could see it as somewhat of a natural fit. Yeah, for sure. I mean, for me, I think the pace would be better. I, th- I feel like watching a little bit of the Nuggets, and you would you would know better than me. But the pace is a lot slower than the year before. Um, watching. Um, Grant with the Oklahoma City Thunder. I watch a lot of OKC. You know me and the Russell Westbrook Thunder. Mm-hmm. Um, and watching some of those games and then watching a few with him in Denver, you know, you're kind of going a lot more through Jokic, just not bring the ball, push the ball up court, you know, come heck or high water. You know what I mean? Like, it, it definitely felt a little bit more deliberate. Um, and again, maybe you could either confirm or deny that. But I think that Grant's strength on both ends is, is in the open court using that athleticism to kind of either wreak havoc and switching, guarding one through five, coming from the weak side, blocking shots, going to play center. You know, um, he did a lot of that with OKC. You know, they um, they would uh, other teams would run mismatches with Steven Adams while running him pick and rolls um, while Grant was on the back. And then Grant would come from the other side and just totally take him out the play. Um, and he even guarded some real physical centers and more than held his own um, on the Marcus Alls and even last year on, on the Jokic's from time to time. So I think that that is more of um, a, a better fit for him where, I mean, with the Wolves, it is a more wide open space. And with the other defenders, and I'm using that word 
um, very, very lightly on the team that will potentially be around him. Yeah, maybe that's too much for him to be expected to or even reasonably consider making up for their mistakes on that end. But um, I, I would love the versatility that he'd have and just the ability to fill in the lane and have an open floor with Carl Anthony Towns, with Beasley, with D'Angelo Russell, um, just all spacing it out. Yeah, and I, I will – yes, I, one of my theories about the fit with Grant in Denver this year is that it took – it has taken him more time than people assumed it would for him to adjust to Denver's offensive system. Yeah. Um, I think that a lot of people saw his skill set and his athleticism and his ability to shoot the three but also get up for dunks and thought that – you know, with Jokic just passing and how Denver likes to pass the ball so much that he would just fit in naturally. But I think that um, what we saw is someone who, A, started the season in a backup role with a bench lineup that had limited spacing, which which hurt him. And sure. second, when he moved into the starting lineup, when Millsap got hurt for ex- an extended period, it took time to get used to Nikola Jokic's playmaking, how he reads the floor, what type of passes he should send Grant, um, when he should cut, when he should space the floor, where he should be on the floor at times, um, and just the flow, the pace. It was, the Denver plays, like you said, a very methodical uh, unlike previous Nuggets teams, this, this team was dead last in pace, so they operate in the half court a lot. So I think it's taken him more time to adjust to that, and you might see, if he comes back next season with the Nuggets, you might see an, uh, a better season from him in terms of his fit and his comfort level, um, just given more having more time to integrate into the system. I get you. I, I completely agree with that. And that is intriguing to see, you know, how players – you just look at their skill set and then they have, you know, trades or free agency signings and you're like, okay, this team needs this, 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 X, Y, Z. This player can provide QRS, Y, Z. This should be a perfect fit. And it's a lot more than that. It's the play style entirely. You know what I mean? Yeah, the team may need that rebounding, shot blocking and, and running. But if you're a team that's more of a plotting kind of methodical team on one end and, and doesn't either make the, the best use of the other players' attributes or they have a hard time blending it within the team structure, obviously you have some issues there. So... Yeah, I, 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 that's what I would target. Um, and again, it remains to be seen if he picks up the option. If he doesn't, how much it would take to go there. Um, obviously, the fit wouldn't be perfect. But for someone with the wingspan and length that he has, you know, shooting as well as he has from three, um, I just love the guy's game. Per 36, 15 points, five rebounds, an assist, a block, just under a steal a game. I mean, that is that that to me is... is is what I think the Timberwolves should look for. But I'm going to throw one more out there and have you kind of discuss it with me before you come with your ideas. What do you think about, you know, this guy's been in the league, what, six years now? Uh, 24, 25, power forward, athletic. You know, he's had his flaws. He hasn't exactly progressed as many would think. Um, he's in a team with a product front court with a lot of guys who, you know, need their minutes, who are, are either established or growing. And, you know, his initials are AG. What what are we thinking about maybe, let's say, the Timberwolves throwing, you know, expiring contract in James Johnson, a future first-round pick? And I would even dangle, let's say, Jared Culver for Aaron Gordon. Yeah, this is, this is interesting because I had actually written him down as part of an answer to a different question we received um, about what oh. non-star player in the NBA is the most ideal fit next to Towns at the four. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> There we go. All right, well, shout out to that. Shout out to that question. We're marking off the list there. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Garrett Bougay, my co-host on uh, Duncan <laughs> Dynasty. Make sure to check that out. But um, Or I'm his co-host. It doesn't matter. Point being, um, yeah, go go on, Eric. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but I, I had so, you know, I had, the, the tough thing with that question is how do we define, like, who is a star? Um, and so what I did when I was coming up with names is, is basically limited it to, to players who were not all-stars this season. Um, and a couple of the names I came up with, Aaron Gordon was one of the names. Um, and the other ones I mentioned, this is obviously just very hypothetical. It would, would not really happen, but, um, Gallinari, if you want to go just purely all Ooh. offense, like forget, forget what defense even is. What is um, that? <laughs> uh, Paul Millsap, I mentioned already. Uh, I think, I think even at his current age would still provide so much defensively for this team. Like he continues to provide for the Nuggets. Um, ironically, Covington, I think, would be a, a, a <laughs> great fit. Of course, they had to get rid of him to, to get Beasley and Hernan Gomez and the, the draft pick from the Hawks. Um, so that, that's not going to happen. Um, yeah. Jaron Jackson Jr., if we could just you know have a clean slate and just like build a team like Jaron Jackson Jr. and Towns, both had incredible offensive shooting as, as big men. 
Jaron Jackson, like we talked about in our Young Cores podcast, has, has disappointed, I think, on the defensive end, given his expectations when he was getting drafted. But I still think his versatility and ability to eventually, in a year or two, be an elite rim protector would be very intriguing next to Towns. Um, and Aaron Gordon was the other guy I had named. Um, I think it'd be I think it'd be really interesting. And, um, you know, his shooting has, has come or has come and gone over the years. You know, his 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 situation in Orlando has changed a lot where they want him to play the three and then the four. And then they've added other guys like Isaac and Vucevic has been a stalwart there. They drafted Mo Bamba. Um, but, you know, he still has some athletic abilities. You know, he still has the tools to be a good defender. I just don't think, you know, they've been applied as well as people would would want them to be. Um, and maybe a new system, a new setting, a, a, a true, you know, we believe in you, you're the starting power forward kind of role would help him a lot. Um, I, I, I don't know. I'm not sure how to project him moving forward. I think maybe you could see uh, something like a Blake Griffin end of the career for him. I mean, he's not old yet, but like the athleticism, the athleticism might wane earlier than you would expect. And then at that point, maybe his skills develop with his three point shooting and ability to run pick and rolls and things like that. Almost like Blake Griffin has done over the past two to three years. So yeah, it'd be interesting. I wouldn't know what the trade would be, but it would be a very intriguing fit to kind of maybe buy low on him. Oh yeah, for sure. And I mean, he's had moments again, Gordon, at least um, at small forward, never, uh, great experiments, but I mean, you can at least like slot him there in, in at times. But um, yeah, I, enough about me and my uh, uh temporary off season measures. I would definitely pursue a power forward in free in free agency or through a trade. Maybe use the draft more for a wing. But but we're gonna you know they, let's say they hear my proposal. Uh, they soundly reject it and they say you know we have a writer for the Denver Nuggets and Eric. Let's see what he would do. <laughs> what would you do? Um. And you already mentioned some just now in answer to the mailbag question. Uh, who would you pers- pursue either through trades or free agency, if anyone, to kind of uh, improve this uh, Timberwolves roster? Yeah, my names are not going to be very sexy. So, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> like, no big ones here. One of my targets would be Jermichael Green. Uh, uh, it's a so- solid, you know, solid power forward, provides some defense, can space the floor, can play small ball five, you know, shouldn't come at, a, at an expensive cost because, you know, one thing we should mention is the Timberwolves probably won't have like cap space to use besides the mid level exception. Uh, which which is valuable. I think it's going to be you know like nine million per year, that kind of value, which is good. But they won't be having you know this is not a clean slate where we can just like afford to give out a bunch of contracts kind of thing. So Jamichael Green, I think, is someone who you can get at a pretty cheap cost and has provided you know you know a good mix of defense and three point shooting at both the four and the five spots over the past couple of years. Um, you know, staying with like cheaper wing, ch- cheaper fours, like a Marvin Williams. Um, he's obviously up there in age, but can definitely shoot the ball, can play small ball five again, should definitely come at a, at a, a cheap cost. You know, those are the types of players that, you know, when you, you get the notification that the Timberwolves have signed Marvin Williams, you're probably not like, oh my God, this is amazing. But someone who can provide, vent, uh, you know, veteran leadership, you know, play a, a 15-ish minute per game kind of role and provide defense and three-point shooting. Um, and I would extend that even to the wing and, and for the wing players target guys like a Mo Harkless, um, Glenn Robinson, the third, um, Derek Jones jr. Could be a very intriguing free agent, uh, target. He's going to be unrestricted. So you might want to throw all of that mid-level at him. He's and on just, my list. Yeah. And just be like, just go crazy, run in transition, you know, cut to the basket. He's not a good three point shooter, but you know, he, he just is so explosive in, a, in in transition. His athleticism can be so overwhelming. Um, and he's pretty young that you might just be like, you know, what? we're going to take a chance on this on the wing and then add like a green and a Marvin Williams at the four spots and kind of go from there. And, you know, they're kind of like what I would, I guess I consider them like stop gaps, but, you know, it's not always the end of the world to get stop gaps while you're trying to find the long term solution at those positions. True. That's solid. A few of those pieces. Uh, I mean, I, I was intrigued by Derek Jones Jr. I don't even know why I didn't glance on my notes to check that one out. But, um, yeah, he's a good one. Uh, Glenn Robinson will be a guy who could immediately, at least like you said, stop gab um, that small forward position. Pretty solid. Had a great year um, last year. A great first half with uh, Golden State for sure. Um, yeah, those are some solid, solid names. Okay, well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we just got to hope the Tim was look for some of those going in. But, um, yeah, all those guys are, are at least um, some measure of availability. Um, just got to see. Again, what the Timberwolves do in the draft and what their target is. What is their order of business? And, you know, that's all we got there. But um, running through some more of these questions here, we've kind of we, nailed. Uh-huh. 
You just mentioned the draft. Should we go to this this uh, question from uh, James Garcia that says, besides Cat, who has been the best draft pick they've actually kept for at least their rookie year in the last 15 years? So, so, my, uh-huh. my caveat is that does that really count Kevin Love? Because technically they didn't draft him. They drafted O.J. Mayo and then made a draft night trade for Kevin Love. See, but if, I did, uh-huh. if it does count Kevin Love, then it's totally him. But Yeah, I, I was going to get to that. <laughs> if it doesn't, we're looking at – Ricky Rubio, uh, Corey Brewer, Zach Levine, uh, Nikola Pekovic. Like, it's not pretty. <laughs> no, it really isn't. I was going to say, we've kind of knocked down. We got one more current um, Timberwolves question. Um, I, I guess we already kind of answered Malik Beasley fan account. Shout out to that. I love that name. I love fan accounts. <laughs> um, basically, the ideal free agency signing, not just signing a superstar. We kind of went over that. Um, but now, yeah, we're going to get to that, which I was going to hit you with the caveat, but you already got to it. Beat me to the punch. We got one more current question, and then we have – um, one by James Garcia, and then uh, two uh, kind of retro questions by at Jeff Cortinas that I thought we'd have some fun kind of going into. So, um, mm-hmm. huh? Yeah, I was just say yeah. It's actually it's nice that we got uh, people weren't forgetting about the last uh, good Timberwolves team. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I wanted to kind of close out with that, but um, we already answered uh, Georgia eleven. Um, the big question is, can Cat go up to top eight play or, or top, what kind of what would he need to be to a top eight player in the league? Um. Just defense, uh, any semblance of decent defense, right? Because offensively, he's there. Yeah, I mean, I think there's potential for him to be a top eight player, but I don't think I'd count on it necessarily because because of the defense. I think um, if you have a little bit of improvement on the defensive end, given just how dominant and uh, incredibly skilled he is on the offensive end, you could you could probably see him being top eight. But the thing with that is, if you just look at if you just were to rank the current top eight top eight guys in the league. It's just hard for big men. I mean, AD is probably the only true big man that you have in the top eight, right, at the moment. Like, it's hard for big men to truly dominate the game as much as guards. And for him to be top eight, he'd probably have to make a a noticeable step defensively while keeping his incredible efficiency and 25 and 10 and four kind of offensive game. Yeah, that's and that's asking for a lot. You're right. That's that's uh. That's a monster fit. We'd have to see what comes up there. But, uh, yeah, I would definitely say, I mean, that's the one hurdle. I don't know how likely it is, but the offensive skill set is so polished and just so great. Defensively, yeah, you've kind of nailed it. But, um, okay, and then I guess this kind of goes to closing out this current Timberwolves. Oh, this current oh, – my fault. Did I mute out? I think I did. This current yeah. Timberwolves um, – my fault. I pressed it. I don't even know why I did have some minorly. But, um <laughs> – uh, in closing out the current Timberwolves, we have one more question. I guess we could use that to kind of finish up with them. On a scale of 1 to 10, how likely is it that we'll start hearing cat trade rumors next season? That's from Matt Esposito. So I guess, you know, where do you – I mean, I don't want to start, you know, putting win-loss records or whatever. We don't even know how good these – uh, you know, what moves the Timberwolves will make. And plus, this gives me another excuse to bring you on for uh, 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 over-unders and stuff that we use. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll put that in the back burner. But basically, what do you see the Timberwolves um, – season looking like next year, roughly. I think if you make any improvements to anything we mentioned, just naturally, I still think you're looking at, like, at best, the 10th spot in the West. I mean, as currently constructed. I just don't know how, you know, let's say Cat's playing and he's healthy. Bam, you're great. And then, obviously, you get more production from Beasley, D'Angelo Russell. I just can't bank on, right now, as currently constructed, their defense holding up enough to really make major strides. Um, And offensively, I mean, it really depends a lot on what – other teams are doing so um in the offseason so i really can't kind of go out there i'm assuming that most teams will pretty much say pat this offseason between a pretty weak free agency class a pretty weak free agency class and just in general with the cap situation and everything i expect more or less some teams come back roughly the same whether re-signing on like a one-year deal or low or whatever the case may be so if i'm looking at it that way i'm still looking at the Timberwolves on the outside in if they were trying to make the playoffs with that being said i don't think you get cat trade r- request or rumors or anything um, at least up through the end of next year, just because it's his first real season with D'Angelo Russell. That's his buddy. That's the guy they moved heaven and earth for to get over there, Um, see how they mesh. I think things have to go just disastrous for uh, Cat to be wanting to go out midway through. But we've seen we, we've seen crazier things happen in the NBA, so I, I, it's not like it's impossible. But um, I think it would have to be something just straight up wild for uh, Cat to, to want to bounce. Yeah, I think on a scale of like 1 to 10, I'd probably say like a 4 or a 5. I think that, you know, I think that having a full season with his friend, you know, would definitely would definitely 
you would think would quiet those rumors from from coming. Yeah. But at the same time, like you just said, and, and I agree with you, I don't I don't see them in the playoffs next year, and that'll be another year where he has to look around at these other bigs like Jokic and Embiid that are in his age range that are continuing to thrive and be in the playoffs and winning 50-plus games. And for a player of his caliber, you, you do sometimes get those things where it's like uh, another losing year, like you know maybe towards the end of, that, end of next season, you start hearing things for the, for the upcoming offseason. And that's why I have it at like a five because I don't think it'll happen during the year, but it, you know if they are... 33 and 49 and you know he looks around and he sees Jokic and Embiid and these other centers winning 50 plus games again he might have to start looking around and being like I've got to start winning look I, he's gonna you know look at himself and say like I'm the caliber of these players or you know I think I'm better than these players but I'm not winning I need to make sure that I win to be properly evaluated in the grand scheme of things so I think that's that's a, a, a key reason why I have it at a, at a five because that might be something that drives some of the rumors towards the end of next season yeah yeah I mean that, that's interesting I had enough again I gave a little more credit a little more optimistic I suppose on them at least giving it a chance to job but you're right and it Again, wouldn't be the first time. Wouldn't even be the first time in Minnesota Timberwolves history that uh, a big man and a guard who are friends end up having an acrimonious split um, over money, winning, whatever the case may be. We'll get to that, but let's go to the the, the first question. I think uh, our first historical question. I think we kind of covered the current Minnesota Timberwolves as they stand. Obviously, there's going to be a lot more updates as far as draft, free agency, signings, trades, all of that good stuff. So we will most certainly revisit them. Um, definitely catch that out here. But um. We got some fun little uh, retro questions, as Eric pointed out, just some that, you know, aren't in the immediate 2020 Timberwolves, but, you know, in the way back machine, the retro machine here. So we're going to start with the um, question from James Garcia on the size cat who's been the best draft pick. I was going to hit you with that caveat there, Eric, if you let me say that <laughs> it had to be. <laughs> you jumped the gun on me, man. It had to be one that the Timberwolves drafted um, in the last 15 years. So uh, that. For me, that takes out um, Kevin Love. And that's what I was trying to get you to do so we could probably see who else, aside from Rubio, could even be in contention. Oof, God, it's, it's rough. Yeah. I'll tell you that much. It's rough. <laughs> 15 years, man. I look back, I'm like, oh, I got a large sample size. And I was like, no, I don't. I mean, I'm looking at these names now, and, you know, Pe- Pekovic in the second round was a, was a good pick. I think he didn't have a, a long career, but he had a – productive, you know, couple of years. Corey Brewer, pick seven in 2007, you know, disappointing overall, considering what else was drafted in that in that draft. But, you know, so, solid. I mean, we're, we're looking at Brewer, you know, Pekovic. I, I mentioned, we mentioned Rubio. You, you probably have to go with Rubio, I think. Yeah. Um, Levine, but, um, but obviously, and, and I guess, you know, Levine was a key piece in getting Jimmy Butler. So does that count for his value as a draft pick? <laughs> <laughs> You throw it out there. I, I would go and even give a look at uh, Rashad McCants. Uh, yeah. He was drafted way back. He wasn't super great, but he had a year, his third year in the league, 14 points a night, two rebounds, two assists, uh, 40% from three on four attempts a game. And in 2008, that wasn't bad. Um, but for his career, I mean, he played his prime years in Minnesota, and that was four or five total seasons. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, don't they, know. Huh? Yeah. They drafted Wayne Ellington in 2009. I guess he's had a solid career. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is interesting. Wow. I Yeah, I'm looking back. I didn't even realize how many guys have they they've been drafted and moved around, you know? Uh, I my eyes immediately went to Derek Williams and uh Oof. and <laughs> and and luminaries such as Wesley Johnson. Um but then I realized I'm a sucker for flops. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it has yeah. not been pretty. It's really I think I probably would go with Rubio if if love doesn't count. Um, but yeah, I'd go with Rubio if love doesn't count. If we can count love, then we just th- we say Kevin Love and don't think twice about it. <laughs> yeah, I guess you're right on that. I mean, mind you, looking back on this did show me one thing, and I know I wrote the article uh, actually for your site at the time we talked about this a while back, but this could have been so much different mm-hmm. in 2009 if David Kahn had made just a half thought out move. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it is a tragedy, but um. We'll move from that one. Great question, James Garcia. Thanks for that quick, short, sad look into the Minnesota Timberwolves draft history. Um, we got two from uh, at Jeff Cortinas. Um, the first, what would have been the top outcome if KG and Marbury would have stayed together? Uh, and I really want to get your thoughts on this one because, um, you know, that was a, a, a electric backcourt pairing that was pretty much over before the year 2000. Uh, as, you know, Marbury kind of got a little jealous of the attention or the money, whatever the case may be, um, demanded trade and was sent to New Jersey. 
Um, and then that pretty much marked the end of a really good point guard that um, KG would be playing with. Uh, you know, you could put, include Terrell Brandon, but he was injured up until 2004 when they got uh, Sam Cassell. But uh, what do you think was the ceiling there? Because, you know, if you're setting it back, you still have the Lakers already had Shaq and Kobe by that point. The Spurs were, were, were still with the Twin Towers and their supporting pieces. Um, the Kings were kind of coming together. This is interesting because their main Western Conference opponents during those years were more or less formed by the time they split. Yeah, it is interesting. And I I, I don't know because I'm not – like, you know, Marbury was obviously an electric offensive talent, but he, his, his defense was bad. And, you know, I think that that probably would have limited their ceiling – um, I think that with the right supporting cast around those two guys, you probably could have seen them making maybe like an extra Western Conference Finals than they actually did in real life. You know, they obviously they made it in 2004. But, you know, maybe you've seen extra Western Conference Finals in, in those years if they keep them together. But I, I, I just I don't know, because like you said, those other contenders in the West were formed and were powerful. And I just don't know if if, if Marbury really was the right piece because I think Sam Cassell brought a lot to, you know, obviously he was old when he got to the Minnesota, but like yeah, he obviously 34. brought a lot to the table that one season. And, and I think that was a key part in them, you know, obviously with other pieces making that conference finals. So I just, you know, maybe I guess you see an extra conference finals appearance if they kept them together. But I think Marbury's defense and just his high level ceiling as a player and a contributor on an elite playoff team probably limits limits their true ceiling you know, to, to not much farther than it actually was in real life. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I think it, it, it's it's so weird thing about that. Because I'm looking at now, I'm like, the 99-2000 uh, Timberwolves, they they won 50 games. They went 15-32, uh, lost in the first round to the Blazers. And, you know, you had Terrell Brennan at the point, and this was probably his healthiest season um, in Minnesota. And he basically averaged... 17 and nine, nine, 17 points and nine assists for them. And I'm like, okay, you know, if you had a serviceable guard, I think that was the one knock on Brandon was just that he was kind of injury prone. Um, mm-hmm. And you're right, defensively, I mean, why he's doing that? Marbury had similar stats uh, 17 and nine for Terrell Brandon. Marbury had 22 and eight. So it wasn't a crazy difference. And I might add, he shot way worse from three. Terrell Brandon wasn't exactly a noted three point bomber, but uh, Marbury shot 28% on three attempts a night. Um, <laughs> back in New Jersey. So it was, it was different. Um, I don't know. I think you're right. I wouldn't put it, I wouldn't let the, I wouldn't say that they, um, would go like they did to, you know, like, uh, the Timberwolves in 2004 with like a future in 2005. I think those teams are just too strong. Um, the Timberwolves always had just a good stable of lackluster to mediocre big men. Um, mm-hmm. the shooting yeah. guard position was kind of weird. So yeah, I, I, I think you, like you said, a Western Conference finals appearance, um, maybe a couple more 50, you know, 45 to 50 win seasons, um, depending on how well the pieces were that meshed around them. But I'm not seeing a championship in the Twin Cities because of that pairing. Yeah, I agree. Okay, and then we got one last question, also by Jeff Cortinas, also, I guess, a relatively uh, quick one. How would Wally Zerbiak fit in today's NBA, Eric? I think he'd fit in pretty well. I mean, given his shooting and, and his kind of, like, additional playmaking abilities, I feel like... You know, I think in today's NBA, he play you know, a lot more four than he did at the three. Um, and, you know, you want to have him, I think the defense would be a concern, but by, by slotting him down a position, he would, he would not have to guard as much on the perimeter in today's NBA. Uh, he could still shoot the ball, space the floor, you know, you know, make ca- capable passes and playmaking within the offense. Like, I don't think, you know, he, he made one all-star game. Um, you know, in 2002, when he averaged 18.7 points per game and, you know, almost five rebounds and three assists per game, shot 45% from three, a career 40% three-point shooter. So, I mean, first of all, anyone that can shoot, obviously the volume was limited in those days, but anyone who can shoot well, you know, makes it in some role in, in today's NBA because that's how <laughs> much of an emphasis, you know, elite three-point shooting is. But he could do a little bit more than that. And I think because he could do a little bit more of that as a scorer, as a little bit of a playmaker, I think he fit in pretty well. You, you just play him more at the four and, and kind of go for there for some more odd, modern offensive spaced lineups. You know what? I have to agree. I, I think I'm thinking Chandler Parsons. Well, uh, you know, like 2000, like 13 or 14 Chandler yeah. Parsons. Oh, oh. <laughs> no, 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 not yeah. I mean, I could, cause I couldn't think 
I don't know. I think Chandler Parsons had – I don't know if he was, like, always, you know, like, your primary offensive initiator. I wouldn't put him as, like, a Joe Ingles or anything. And I'm not just picking out because of stereotype, like, players or anything in roles, but, like, someone who's a, a noted shooter, can space the floor, f- f- you know, flash some playmaking ability. I think that he would probably have the ball more. I mean, back then he was getting, like, I think his uh, career high was, what, 3.2 assists a night. So it wasn't like he was really getting that many. But different times back then, you would think with the way the NBA is now, you put the ball in his hands a little more, kind of like a secondary initiator. Yeah, he definitely wouldn't be like a like prime, prime Parsons. But I'm seeing someone like that with a good size frame, decent shooter. Well, not decent, just a really good shooter um, who could, you know, ca- like not carry the offense, but kind of help along in stretches. Yeah, I agree. I, th- I, think, he, I think he would, you know, do well. I mean, today's game is, especially in the regular season, is just so there's so much emphasis on offense. And I think given his shooting, he would be able to fit in in some capacity in the league pretty well and just be an offensive floor spacer and, you know, secondary or, or tertiary creator in the offense and just move the ball and things like that. Yep. Well, this has been a lot. Uh, this has been a lot of fun as well. Thank you for kind of going in here and helping me uh, delve into this almost an hour and a half of uh, Tim Wolf's <laughs> content. So uh, that's great. I-, I appreciate your time, man. Thanks again for jumping on. We'll have to do this very soon. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Of course, man, this is uh, Eric Spropolis. Uh, you can find him at Eric Spiros. Uh, you want to get great Paul Reed takes, really <laughs> good Denver Nuggets content, uh, Denver Nuggets writer, all around NBA person. Hit up the guy. He is your one-stop shop for uh, NBA conversation. Um, as for me, follow me at Corbin NBA. Uh, make sure to check out HoopBall, um, hoop-ball.com, and at HoopBall Tweets, fantasy basketball perspectives, obviously, with the season pretty much over as far as fantasy is concerned. You can still get the advice you need to get fired up for next year. You still have great team coverage, great player profiles, statistical measures, um, a good stable of team co- of team um podcasts uh the fantasy nba uh group is actually doing an expansion draft for each team uh protecting eight players that's been very interesting to check out so make sure you look into that and uh aside from that uh you can catch me real soon here on nba today we'll have another team maybe the same guest maybe another wink wink who knows but um until then man it's been corbin thanks a lot ladies and gentlemen y'all have yourselves a good one This has been a Hoop Bowl presentation.